Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And see the long-term impacts of climate change. But we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. As Emerald Planet looks around the globe, we're looking beyond the horizon because, as we know, climate change is becoming more pronounced, more dangerous, and more destructive than every place on planet Earth. And so we have to be much more aggressive and much more proactive as the technologies that are being introduced. And we have one called FlowZone, and it's uh, FlowZone Services, Inc., represented by Tony Engel. He is the director of technology that actually has been around for two decades. Uh, it's being deployed across the United States, not widely known, but yet seems to be making profound changes, not only in really urban built areas, but also in rural communities as well, where they have these massive data centers. So Tony, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about FlowZone, and then we're going to uh, go right into the technology itself. But give us a little history of FlowZone, and, uh, and then we'll progress to the technology and why it is so important. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so FlowZone, uh, as you said, started uh, roughly 20 years ago. Um, we decided that we wanted to be more of a technology-based uh, company versus the industry standards of, of chemicals. Uh, but we also wanted to look at the building as a whole as it relates to HVAC. So we developed a number of products uh, for cooling tower, uh, for closed loops, and for indoor air quality, and um, had it tested throughout part of the country and uh, have a, quite a wide distribution. Um, and we've even had uh, been featured with the Federal Energy Management Program. They did some research on us. Uh, and actually listed us as a top 10 best practice. That's absolutely fantastic. And looking at this deployment across the United States uh, for uh, a company that's uh, really has uh, been flying literally below the, the radar, uh, this is a, a wide deployment. So why is it across the entire United States? That's actually question number one. Question number two, how has that really allowed you to test and enhance the technology by having such a broad-based deployment uh, in different climatic zones? Yeah, so the country itself uh, has multiple water sources that it pulls from. So testing the technology uh, across the entire country was key to uh, proving out that the technology can be uh, viable uh, everywhere. So, you know, looking at it in California, Nevada, Texas, uh, Florida, those those places, uh, we were able to demonstrate that the technology can replace chemicals uh, and be viable uh, for the future. Now, looking at this machine, it looks very simple, uh, yet it's very profound in what it can do. Uh, tell us how this operates. And uh, you've mentioned uh, several times no chemicals. Why is that so yeah. critically important as we move through the 21st century? Uh, we're over 80% urban areas now and becoming more urbanized as a planet. So eliminating chemicals, uh, what are the, some of the multiple steps of why that's so important? Well, um, chemicals themselves have had issues uh, throughout history. There's been movies about them. There's been multiple movies with multiple uh, movie uh, A-list characters doing it. People may remember Aaron Brockovich. 
Uh, that movie was actually about chromates, uh, which was coming from the cooling towers. Uh, so there's been a there's been a quiet push in the industry to find other ways to treat these cooling towers um, without chemicals, uh, but largely have been unsuccessful. Uh, that's why we were so uh, pushing so hard to do a nationwide look at can this work throughout the country. And in doing so, we developed uh, three three different technologies to do so. The first one is a patented technology. Uh, it's a QED. It's an RF uh, frequency that uh, replaces the scale chemicals uh, in the cooling tower. So it eliminates uh, or keeps uh, chemicals, uh, keeps the scale in check. Um, and then we use ozone, uh, which has been in the industry for a while. Um, but we use that to eliminate the biocides and keep biologics in check. And then we came up with our own 24-7 uh, monitoring system to kind of wrap it all together. Uh, because you have to have a way to um, monitor these systems to make sure that they're operating uh, efficiently, uh, not only for us, but for the customer. Yeah, and that's something that's very important. And I wanted to get to this uh, diagram here. Walk us through what we're actually seeing, Tony, and why do you have, you've got the, uh, and you use the acronym HVAC, so that's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Why are HVAC systems so critically important as we're moving through the 21st century? And what does this diagram actually mean to people that are living, working, and recreating in these high-level buildings? Yeah, so uh, what people may not understand is that uh, buildings operate on a similar scale as what, the, as what your home might. So you have an HVAC at your home that allows for you to stay heat, uh, hot, cold, you know, whatever that you may uh, need. When you're looking at a building, uh, it has similar needs. It has to remove heat. It has to put cold in there to keep people comfortable. And it does so through much larger systems than what people uh, may understand. And uh, so cooling towers were developed uh, in order to do that. That's the system on the left there of the screen uh, with the with a chiller. And so there's piping that goes through that. And you have to be able to keep those systems clean in order to make them efficient. So you want to keep the Keep the minerals in check you want to keep the biologics in check but it goes further than that and what we call it is out of sight out of mind there are actual like arteries of the building those are the smaller pipes that you see in the in the frame there and those are the closed loops and those are typically out of sight out of mind so we developed some technologies uh, that would actually help keep those clean so that it could uh, increase the efficiencies of the building and then we took it a step further and we looked at okay if we can keep the arteries clean and, and whatnot, but we need to also keep the air itself cleaner. And that has never been more prevalent than now uh, with, the, with the advent of COVID and people finally understanding that indoor air quality really matters. So we developed some technology with zone air uh, that can uh, help mitigate uh, a lot of that. And then we wrapped it all together with our E3 Sentinel monitoring program so that we can actually uh, monitor and maintain these systems efficiently. Now, looking at this building, I want to go to these chemical clouds. This is something that people probably have never heard of. Uh, I guess intuitively we could suspect that this is going on around us, but we can't see it. So we don't know about it. So the chemical clouds, what are chemical clouds and why are they so hazardous, not only to human health, but also to all the biologics and the animals that uh, come in contact with these buildings either living in it or are living around them? Yeah, so uh, a chemical plume is uh, what happens off of the top of these cooling towers. And I'm sure people have seen it and they just didn't know what they were seeing at the time. But you'll see on the top of these buildings what looks to be a mist of some sort that is coming off the top of them. And most people don't realize that that's actually the cooling tower itself. And it is, evaporating water off out of the system in order to cool the water down in order to bring more heat out of the building. But when it evaporates that water, more than just water enters the atmosphere. You can have minerals enter the atmosphere on a limited basis, but more importantly, you would have bacteria enter the atmosphere from there, um, from these cooling towers. And that, that kind of came to a head uh, several years back uh, with uh, California and New York uh, New York got a little more heat out of it uh, with the Legionella that that hit the uh, New York City, and those that all came from cooling towers. 
Um, so what we wanted to do was uh, highlight that you can um, eliminate these chemicals and still mitigate the issues that are caused by these cooling towers and these plumes that can come out. Yeah, and actually, I think what you've done, not just mitigate, but actually you're going one better and actually improving the air quality. It's, it's coming out of the buildings sometimes more than what actually is being drawn in uh, to the building. Uh, but uh, you're talking about Legionella is uh, properly known in the media as Legionnaire's disease. And I think uh, everyone will know it by, by its name. But looking at uh, this is uh, your own uh, facility. Uh, but how is this an example of the mass and the scale of buildings that we have all over the United States, all over the globe, actually? And we need to be as humans uh, and caretakers of all other living beings. How do we need to really be concerned about buildings of this size and scale to make sure that they're not doing damage to the communities, uh, animal, uh, human and biologics? Uh, at the same time? Well, buildings on these scales carry uh, a large footprint, uh, more so in how they could potentially damage things than they do in actual what people think of as a, as a square footage footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, buildings of these size will consume massive amounts of water, energy, their output of carbon uh, dioxide uh, and chemical output is significant. Uh, and it needs to be uh, monitored on a on a regular basis. They have uh, the the larger you get, especially manufacturing. There are different rules that applies to uh, to these companies, um, mainly brought on by the EPA and, and state level uh, things. So they're always looking for uh, ways to reduce their footprint, or at least the environmentally friendly companies are. Um, so they're looking for ways to. Uh, reduce their water consumption, reduce their energy consumption, and so forth. And uh, we're hoping that we can help them do that. Well, uh, not hope, you're actually doing it. So uh, <laughs> let's go from that. But uh, this whole emphasis, and we're running out of time, Tony, uh, no chemicals. Why is it critically important? Let's be quick, because there's a couple of the slides that I want to put up before we finish. Yeah, so uh, no chemicals is important uh, because uh, chemicals are actually damaging the environment, more so uh, in the fact that um, the chemicals is what's caused these superbugs that we keep running into. Uh, the chemical, the, the bugs themselves will actually mutate and you'll come up with uh, resistant strains like MRSA, uh, that's methicillin resistant. Uh, and what that means is it has converted itself so that it, certain chemicals don't affect it. So by using uh, technology similar to ozone or even ozone itself, um, biologics can't become immune to those and so that it is an instant kill. So we, we run a less risk of uh, creating uh, issues in the future by using technologies versus chemicals. Okay, fantastic. And uh, we're gonna go out on this. Why is every drop that every non-used kilowatt, uh, every non-release of chemical clouds uh, and uh, every uh, non-use of the land to landfill the biologics out of this so important, and we have 30 seconds for that. We have a finite amount of resources on this planet, and, and water is one of the most important ones. We have people look at this earth and they see uh, all the water everywhere, but they don't understand that that's not usable, at least currently not usable in, with the technology we have today. So. Uh, we have to find ways uh, to limit the amount of resources we take out of the environment, water and energy included. Um, so that's that's been our push is our technology allows for customers to reduce their uh, impact on the environment. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go out on this. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. What do you see for the uh, the long term development of flow zone over the next five, 10 or 15 years? You got 15 seconds. Uh, we see FlowZone as a disruptive technology, and um, we envision it to take a major foothold uh, within the HVAC industry. And with the help of companies like Pangea, uh, we're hoping to make an impact globally. That's fantastic. Thank you for being with us, Tony Engel, as we create the Emerald Planet. Thank you.